Because we really heard a lot about um, sort of the individual development, some of those, those um, factors that influence the development of, um, of students even before college, right? Um, I think a colleague shared some of those really important um, uh, concepts and phenomenons. I'm going to um, sort of frame my, my part of it in campus ecology. And I'm borrowing this from student development theory. Um, it's really looking at the relationship between the individual student and the environments of the colleges that they're in. Um, the focus is on a trans, uh, transactional relationship. So we're not just focusing on the students as individual um, uh, vessels navigating a system, but we're looking at the system and how the system um, interacts and affects the daily lived experience of the student on campus. So it's a reciprocal relationship. The student affects the environment just as the environment affects the student. That's my frame. I'm going to concentrate more on how the campus environment sort of impacts the students and their development, both academically and emotionally, um, through the college years. So what the student brings. My colleagues already kind of went into this, and for sake of time, I'm not going to go into it uh, in much depth. But the students often bring a different or no conceptualization of a mental health paradigm when they step onto a college or university campus. And this is because many communities of color conceptualize mental health issues much differently than the, the contemporary forms that I'm sure all, the, all of us up here um, who are in psychology learned, right? We learned that you know, the most beneficial treatment is going in and speaking to somebody one-on-one -on -one for therapy, often someone who's a stranger. I think that's important to keep in mind. And possibly taking some kind of psychotropic medication to help, help you along the way, right? And we learned those are very effective. Studies have shown that these are very effective uh, methods for addressing mental health issues. But a lot of communities of color do not see those as even options, right? So they don't see going and talking to a stranger about your problem as an option. And by far and by, uh, and even more, more so, they don't see taking a medication as a form of, of effective treatment. They might be more reliant on implicit forms of social support. If they're coming from a collectivistic um, unit, um, your, 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 your family is who provides you that support. And it's often implicit. It's something um, that is not really asked for. It's just there. It's inherent in that, in that family unit. That's important to keep in mind. Because they're going to college, leaving that unit, and they're not having this sort of around them to support them along. They might go to maybe a religious or spiritual leader for healing, right? That's something that they know that they trust. Um, it might be similar to what you might find in individual counseling, but it's much different. That relationship is much different, and the expectations are much different. Um, I often encounter this in my work with college counseling, uh, in college counseling centers with students and having to sort of redefine the paradigm for, for mental health. Um, to, to include those measures as well, but also to include some of the more contemporary forms that I, that I practice. They might also turn to the creative arts as a way of, of healing as well. And, and that's sort of taking more shape even in uh, more contemporary forms of, of, and mainstream forms of treatment, bringing in, in dance, bringing in music, um, bringing in, in drawing, and those sorts of things as a means of expressing, uh, expressing emotion, right? Oftentimes, these students might be coming from communities where there is a... A, a, a finite or a, uh, a narrow degree of emotional expression that's acceptable, both for men of color and for women of color. Uh, we see this in the main, in, in dominant majority cultures as well, but I think it might even be more um, nuanced for uh, communities of color, so teaching those kinds of things. And also this adjustment to an un unfamiliar environment. <clears throat> Excuse me, here's where my voice is starting to go. Um, some of the um, issues that we might see a student of color um, uh, manifest or present on college campus in terms of compromises to well-being might not be something that was there inherently, but might just be simply a mere reaction to an unfamiliar environment that they're trying to navigate. Well, that's what the student's bringing into this uh, equation. So the next question I'm going to tackle is what happens when students of color arrive on campus? A number of things happened, and some of my, my colleagues already went into that. This imposter syndrome that was already there becomes ignited, right, and is maybe even more salient because it's in an academic domain. But this is who they're um, sort of encountering in terms of who they see visibly around them. Those, those visible impressions are often the most important impressions that somebody has when they enter any environment. And so this is data taken from the National Center for Education Statistics 
on just sort of a snapshot of students enrolled in degree-granting programs um, at post-secondary institutions across the country. So we see the majority still are white students, followed by uh, Latino and black students, which, comp which uh, compose about 15% each, and then Asian Pacific Islanders, about 6%, American Indians, uh, less than 1%, and then biracial, multiracial, about 25 So we're seeing that a student of color who's coming on campus is probably going to see little representations of themselves amongst the student body. And that's going to send a message to the student, which I'll go into later. This one actually brought me to tears when I was putting this into my presentation last night, or not last, when a, a few days ago, or, or what have you. Um, in 2011, um, uh, they found that 80% of faculty were white. So this is instructional staff across the board, 80%. 9% were Asian Pacific Islander, 6% were black, 4% were Latino, and less than 1% are Native American or Alaska, uh, Alaska Native. Now, that is extremely important to acknowledge for many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I think even at an HBCU or Hispanic serving institution, you're still gonna see some, depending where you are, I happen to work at an, an HSI, and the majority of our faculty are white. And only, um, I'm on the Latino studies and um, Latin American studies uh, subcommittee, and that pretty much pulls together all the Latinos on campus, which could be a microaggression in some respects. Because uh, <laughs> we're asked, I'm like, well, that's not really my major focus, but I will be here because I know this is going to be where I'm going to see other faculty that look like me. I'm there, right. Right? And that's a very small group of people. Like, there are probably 10 of us in that group. Um, and I, I include the faculty. I don't have the stats for staff, but the staff are probably going to mirror this, but probably not to the same extent. Because these are the people that the students are going to primarily come into contact on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They're there to take classes. So it's good to keep in mind that they're probably not going to see representations of themselves amongst the student body and less likely to see them within their interactions with faculty. And again, this is all sending a message, and you are all probably feeling that message right now as you read these. So what else happens? Again, they might be unfamiliar with the campus culture, right? Especially for students who have other intersections of identity playing into this equation. Again, um, a, a person, a student of color isn't just of color, right? They have other identities as well, right? They have a gender identity, right? They um, have a generational status. You know, I'm first generation. There are others up here that were first generation. It's highly likely that a student of color is going to be a first generation or a new generation college student. So they don't have that language. They don't have that ability to articulate um, what uh, they're encountering on campus. Um, we have to look at sexual orientation um, as well. They might be LGBTQ students of color, and that's going to be intersecting in a very nuanced and special way um, as compared to possibly white students where sexual orientation issues might be conceptualized differently or accepted differently within their families of origin. And then we have to look at social class, which I think is also important. Right? We know that there are disproportions in our society overall between the haves and the have-nots. And the people of color tend to fall in the have-nots in all of these categories. And one is this idea of, uh, of social class, which includes not only income, but educational attainment, the neighborhoods that you live in, which affect the cultural institutions that you have access to. And all of these have an impact on how the student is going to navigate this uh, new environment. And then experiences with microaggressions and stereotype threat. And as I was sitting up here, I heard the three behind me saying both of these terms, uh, microaggressions and stereotype threat. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on. I was also extremely pleased when I was looking at the website for uh, CSREA that there was actually an event last night, I believe, on microaggressions. So that's my primary um, area of expertise and research. And it's really exploded over the past uh, seven or eight years to taking hold not only in academic institutions, but I'm, I've done work within hospitals and community agencies and governmental agencies. And so it's really taking root across the board, which is really important, because these are really insidious interactions. Who here has not ever heard of microaggressions? And it's OK. I'm not going to punch you <laughs> out. Okay. I saw one hand. Yeah, OK. So they are subtle, covert forms of discrimination. Um, they are thought of to be more uh, commonplace than old-fashioned, overt forms of discrimination. Um, they are often unintentional from the perspective of the uh, person who enacts the microaggression. And they are often um, out of the level of awareness for both the perpetrator and the person who is aggressed. So they're 
There are these in interactions, very insidious. People experience them on a daily basis. Um, I experienced one on my way to the hotel last night. We'll have to get into that. But um, <laughs> we experience people of marginalized backgrounds, not just race, but ethnicity, uh, social class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, et cetera. Any marginalized class is going to experience them. And there's probably a relationship between microaggressions and stereotype threat, which is another aspect of the college experience for many marginalized people. Studies have been done, particularly with women and with uh, people of color, on stereotype threat, which is uh, pretty much when somebody internalizes a negative, well, all stereotypes tend to be negative, but a, 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 a negative stereotype of oneself, such as having a lower academic um, achievement capability. And that may or may not be true with their actual capability, but when they're placed in a domain that activates that, such as an academic institution or a classroom or a testing environment, that stereotype threat takes life. It becomes activated, and it kind of takes control subconsciously for the student, and they tend to have a poor outcome. And this has been done, ex experiments that have actually shown that when you, when you sort of intervene at a certain point, that you can sort of erase the effects of stereotype threat. Um, so I think that these two are also important experiences that should be taken into consideration. How much time do you have? About four. About five, four minutes. Four. Okay, so I'm going to go into a couple predominant microaggressions that college students are likely to experience. Um, environmental microaggressions, I think these are some of the most insidious forms because they are, in the, they are embedded in the environments around us. We don't need somebody saying something to us to experience these. One is, and the one I already showed are the demographics, and someone might be thinking, no one here looks like me, right? That is very distancing, that is very devaluing, that is very othering and ostracizing. The content of the curriculum, mm. even though strides have been made to make our curriculum more multiculturally um, affirmative, they are still very Eurocentric in nature. And so in an American history course where we know the contributions of every race and ethnicity are highly valued, should be highly valued, they've been important, they've been, a, they've been highly impactful, we're still not seeing them. So the student might say, am I not a part of American history because I don't see representations of myself in this curriculum? Cultural student programming, right? Universities do a lot of good work around this, I think. That's one of the strongest um, parts of the college campus in terms of addressing multiculturalism is through programming. However, sometimes these programs are relegated to a month. We're right in the middle of Hispanic Heritage Month which overlaps two months, so I like to take control of both of them, personally. <laughs> I'm trying to get two months. <laughs> so, but the, the uh, implicit message there, but do my people only deserve one month, right? One month out of the year? I am here every month, every day out of the year, but I only get attention this one month. And multicultural affairs and diversity offices. So I, for, I had my start in these offices, and I think they are valuable. They really served really important um, um, uh, places on university campus, especially during the civil rights era up until the current time. So I value them. Um, however, sometimes these can become the only space where a student feels comfortable. And that's when it becomes more of an environmental microaggression, when I only feel comfortable within this, the confines of these four walls and not in the confines of the rest of the 50 acres of this campus. Description of intelligence. So this is a very common microaggression that um, all people of color experience in one way or another. This is when your intelligence is prematurely um, ascribed without any knowledge of the individual person. Uh, black Americans and Latino Americans tend to have their intelligence ascribed to lower levels. Um, Asian Americans tend to have their intelligence ascribed to higher levels, but only in math, sciences, and technology. So they are narrowly uh, prescribed, which can affect their, their career trajectories in very detrimental ways. So, even though that might seem like a compliment, as do many microaggressions, um, it really isn't. This is an excerpt from a study that I had done on Latino Americans, and it sort of shows and demonstrates how one was um, microaggressed while a, a student. So even before entering the a university domain, one is already being told, you don't belong there, right? You shouldn't apply to Stanford. You don't like, look like the kind of student that would spend their time in the library, right? So based just off of the way one looks. This student ended up not going to Stanford, but went to another um, high um, uh, elite institution and graduated and, and is doing great. Another one that I think that deserves attention is this assumption of criminality that black and Latino students um, experience quite often. Um, we might be thinking, what does being treated like a criminal have to do with being on a college campus? Well, it does, because <laughs> <All right. laughs> yes. the college campus is a microcosm of yes. society in general. 
This is also from that same study, and this was a Latino male who was sharing the study of being uh, in a group of other Latinos walking across campus. And this is just one instance um, where they were treated like this. They said this occurred common from the um, campus police. They were actually told to kneel and gravel and have their fingers laced behind their heads until they showed proof that they belonged on that college campus. And why? Only because they were acting suspiciously. suspiciously. And acting suspiciously for a man of color means that you're just a man of color walking down the street. Right? We know this. I don't even have to go into recent events to demonstrate um, the validity of that statement. There are other forms, which I'm not going to go into. Again, I like that uh, students are taking charge and sort of uh, revealing these. Whenever I do microaggression talks and somebody has not heard of them, I often have them come up to me afterwards and thank me for giving them a name to describe the experience. That in, of, in and of itself is very healing. So some students, I believe this is the Fordham students, did a, a BuzzFeed, and these are some examples of some of the microaggressions. And the last one, um, this young man is showing up this sign. The limited representation of my race in your classroom does not make me the voice of all black people. Another form of microaggression, this assumption of, of homogeneity within the cultural group. And because you're the only one in the class, and you're the only researcher, I'm going to look at you. You tell me how we, we are supposed to study people that look like you, right? Again, we might have some answers for that, but it should not be assumed that we have answers for that. And my voice can only represent what's going on here. Amen. I cannot say what's going on for every other Latino or every other black American or every other Asian American in society. Uh, Dr. Coakley already went over these, the impact, uh, so I'm not going to go over those, but the impact is very real. Our microaggression studies are, are now entering the quantitative phases, and they're showing that there are compromises to emotional well-being. There are compromises to physical health issues, right? Just physical health issues. So there's this mind-body connection, mm -hmm. I think, has been demonstrated in the literature, mm -hmm. but it also uh, occurs when we think about, think about these adverse treatments that people experience. So these microaggressions can lead to a, a few factors I think are important that I'll share in closing. Um, this disengagement from the campus environment, right? This is supposed to be the community that the student has chosen and was accepted to attend. But once they get there, they get a whole nother story based on some of those anecdotes that I've shared earlier. So the student can disconnect and disengage from the environment, which they're going to need in order to be successful. Social support, which is also up there, is one of the most important factors that can help buffer somebody against these harmful experiences, but that all, someone can also turn to when they need support, right? So we, when, if they don't have that, that network there on campus, they're going to have a lot, of, a lot more compromises. The development of a negative academic self-concept. So these are one of the constructs that are considered non-cognitive variables that have been researched in, student, in higher ed student affairs that are predictors of success in college, but also well-being in college. So um, if, you're feeling, if you're having your intelligence ascribed negatively, if you're not seeing representations of you on your college campus, that's, that is, has the potential to lead to this negative um, academic self-concept that you have. And the inability to deal with isms in an effective way. That's also a non-cognitive uh, uh, non non variable that's been studied time and again. And isms, I, I have it there because I don't just mean racism. Racism is very important um, in ethnicity. Uh, but we also have to look at classism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, all the isms that one is likely to encounter when they are on campus. And what this racial socialization, that I'm really happy that that was brought up because that often is started, uh, that talks of that is, is, is um, uh, that idea is, laid, is implanted often within the family, but it needs to be continued on into the college setting, this ability to deal with this because that, Racial identity and ethnic identity does transform as one sort of leaves the family home and enters a new academic environment. I know mine did. I, even what I called myself changed. I called myself Spanish growing up because that was what we needed to do in my community. And I called myself Chicano when I went to college. So I sort of changed sort of an ethnic identifier along the way because of how much I sort of grew into know, into know that. And that, in and of, that by itself, that deepening of that knowledge served as a protective factor for me. And we're seeing that this serves as a protective factor for students. They're going to have to navigate these experiences where they're microaggressed, right? That's important. So all these co are connected to optimal well-being. So I want to go down to the last one. So, what, so we do a lot on campus, I think, to address these things. Students of color do seek mental health treatments. Um, I've seen plenty of them. I probably see a disproportionate number compared to my colleagues because another thing that happens if you're a 
psychologist or counselor of color, who do you tend to get refer referred to? You get those students of color, which I love to see, but um, we need to have cultural competency for all providers to be able to work effectively with these students. What happens after graduation? They're often just launched out into this world without any services, and I think this is where we need to be paying special attention to what happens when they leave our care, right? I think referrals are made, I know I make referrals for students, but they're often not in positions, or they're not, often not in the mindset to connect with those referrals, because they're now navig navigating a whole new world, one that's probably more stressful than the family of origin, or this protected college environment that they were in before. So they're sort of let loose by themselves. Mm. Um, they don't have a college counseling center that within blocks of them often. They often have to pay for it, whereas before they didn't. So all those serve as barriers. So more needs to be done to support the mental health of these students once they sort of enter this next stage of life after they leave our care. And I will leave you with that. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome.